for introductions. I'm a senior principal security engineer at, at Medtronic. Uh, I was also the co-chair for the last transgender health conference in the Twin Cities, and I've uh, been involved and in, in very interested in trans healthcare advocacy. And uh, this, this is important to my community. Uh, the, the exclusions on trans healthcare are pervasive. Most insurance plans, uh, public and corporate, uh, and company plans exclude trans people just categorically, and it has some profound impacts for my community. And, and this is a, a serious issue. It can, can be life or death for, for people, trans people. And th things are starting to change. Uh, there are now 511 companies in 2016 that offer fully inclusive trans health care contracts. And uh, right now, one third of the Fortune 500 does. But I'd say that for trans people, not able to access appropriate medical care uh, can lead to significant depression and even suicide. And this is a serious issue in, in my community. And so equitable health care is really critical. I'm going to talk about a couple term definitions, summary plan documents, uh, EOCs. These are a, a document that's created uh, with your employer and the insurance company that, that actually has to be provided to you that describes some of the detail and the me mechanics of how these plans work. And so you typically, as an, an employee, often get like a one or two page PDF saying things are in network or out of network and, and that's it. But there, there is, if, if, you, if you ask for it, uh, sometimes it's from your employer, sometimes from your insurer, there's additional information that describes in detail. I, I know our SPD is, is around 180 pages. I think it's a fairly lengthy document. And, and on top of that, the insurer, whether they contract with uh, whichever insurer, whether it's you know, a Blue Cross or a Medica or whatever, they have a, uh, a clinical guideline that talks about how certain uh, conditions and things will be diagnosed, treated, and reimbursed. And so it's important you actually take, get both of these sets of documents and, and combine them. And you can think of that uh, insurer's clinical, uh, in clinical guidelines is kind of like a standard library you're importing into your code. And a lot of times those back end clinical guidelines have some horrible legacy, ancient, incorrect language. And so it's like you're importing bugs into your health plan and, and this is something that's really critical as you analyze this from a whole or its entirety. I'll, I'll talk about WPATH, the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. And, and they're an organization that's existed for decades of, of aspects around how to diagnose appropriately, treat, and, and provide proper health care to trans people. So they're in their seventh edition, seventh revision, and that's important because many of these legacy health plans, even if they are kind of try to be trans inclusive, have language in them from WPATH versions from years and decades past. And, and these, these, these revisions don't happen very quickly. Uh, the last WPATH version six was 15 years ago. And so a lot has changed in trans health care over that uh, 15 years. And so that's another reason why you need to understand on the back end of those policies what is, what is the mechanics that's driving that health care. <clears throat> and then the DSM. I'll mention this um, strictly because in, there was an important change between the DSM-4 and the DSM-5. In the DSM-4, we were considered gender identity disorder, 302.85. In the DSM-5, we're gender dysphoria, and we've been pulled out of the disorders section. So you see many health plans still referring to us as disorder, uh, gender identity disorder, and that, that is legacy language. It should be removed from plans, uh, just like... Uh, being gay or lesbian was once considered a mental disorder. The trans people, we finally got pulled out of the DSM as a disorder. And so if your health plan references disorders, or if you see someone on TV talking about trans people are disordered, they're using language from long, long ago. So, so as you start going through your summary plan documents and, and the care, the place you want to start, there's always a section, conditions not covered or exclusions. And that's, that's really where you want to start digging in and understanding. And, and you'll, you'll find oftentimes if trans people are category excluded from healthcare, that's where it'll be. So here's, I've got some interesting examples up on the screen. These were pulled out of, straight out of health plans that, that I've researched. I've got literally a couple hundred of them. 
a strange thing to collect, but uh, so, so the first one, services for or leading to sex transformation surgery. I'll say not only is that an exclusion, it's profoundly ignorant. Um, that, that's ignorant language. And this last, last one, transsexual surgery, including medical or psychological counseling and hormone therapy and preparation for or subsequent to any such surgery. I'd point out that this has effects far beyond just denying us transition-related care. If I'm a transgender woman who's had bottom surgery, I, I need to still have mammograms. I need GYN care checkups. This will actually deny me any access to health care after transition. And so these kind of things or pitfalls are in many corporate and, and employer health policies and actively deny trans people's access to just preventative medical care. <clears throat> I, I pulled out a couple things from, uh, from a, and again, these are, these are straight out of health plans I found. And, and they're contrary to the WPATH standards of care and sometimes make completely factually incorrect uh, statements. So one is uh, they, they basically do not cover facial hair removal. Well, I'd say for transgender women, uh, for any of us that transitioned after puberty, we usually need some facial hair removal. And, and so it's definitely medically necessary and it's always excluded from plans. So, so that's an example. Now this, this next one is, is lifted verbatim out of a Twin Cities insurers insurance policy covering trans people. And literally, in their clinical guidelines, it says pubertal suppression therapy is considered unsafe and is therefore not covered. This, action, this assertion is false. It goes contrary to medical, uh, medical standards, the WPATH standards of care, and, and physicians and, and experts that have this expertise in working with gender variant children and diagnosing and, and understanding where they fall. It can actually save lives of adolescent youth why subject someone, a youth that is, so, that, that is so gender dysphoric to go through a horrifying puberty? And so, so that, that actually is dangerous to, to a trans youth. And that is literally the standard language or the clinical guidelines that are in the back end of a Twin Cities-based insurer. So if your health plan just says, OK, we're going to cover trans health care, that takes into effect. And that will actually restrict those youth. Or the, youth of employees. <clears throat> Here's a couple other ones. Uh, this one, a uh, member has met the criteria for the diagnosis of true transsexualism. And I, I remember looking at that, it's like, what are they thinking? And what is a true transsexual? And it turns out uh, in 1963, Harry Benjamin actually used that term when he was studying trans people and understanding best ways to alleviate gender dysphoria. And he actually rejected that term some not many years later, and he said he realized that gender identities existed on a continuum or a spectrum, and, and said, you know, this doesn't make sense. So this is actually burned into a health plan. Uh, the other member has completed a recognized program at a specialized gender identity treatment center. Uh, in the early days, yeah, we had to travel. There was a dozen places around the country that had gender identity treatment centers attached to universities. Actually, Minnesota has one. and and we had to travel to those. But if you think about it today, there's, there's many, many providers in pri private practice that now can provide this, this care uh, consistent with the standards of care very effectively. And so most trans people actually don't go to a specialized gender center these days. Um, I, I'd point out this came out of a health plan, and I actually did figured out the mileage. The nearest gender identity treatment center at a university was 1,800 miles from where the people worked at. So, so you're saying that by this stipulation and that insurance plan, they would have to travel 1,800 miles once a week for hormones and therapy and that stuff, which creates an insurmountable barrier to care. And I think maybe that's why the insurer put it in there, to make sure nobody could actually utilize it. Um, I threw up there, here, here would be a very inclusive encompassing what would be appropriate to cover in it. It's, it's not that every trans person gets all these procedures or any of these procedures, uh, but this is a very inclusive document, describes the things in the WPATH standards of care that, that some trans people may access, that may be medically necessary, that may be required to alleviate their dysphoria, 
<clears throat> and so these are some of the procedures that should be there. And, and so something like this in a plan would help override some of that bad language of an insurer. And, and this is way more than you can read, and I'd be happy to talk about trans health care after this. Um, some other barriers to care uh, that, that people don't think about in health insurance plans is the way insurers use gender treatment codes and, and reimburse for gender treatment codes. So the, the problem this creates is, uh, as an example, transgender women, whether they're, they've had bottom surgery or not, typically have a prostate. So if they have a family history of prostate cancer, they need regular checkups, they need monitoring, and they may, need, they may actually get prostate cancer and need to be treated. If, if the insurer is using these gendered codes and you've legally changed your gender to female, now all of a sudden you can't get covered for something that's your body. Uh, correspondingly, <clears throat> transgender men who are female assigned at birth, may, they may still retain some organs, which requires things like pap smears. And so it's very important that you override these stupid gender codes that, that tend to happen in insurance plans and say, you know what we're going to do, and I've got an example in the next slide, <clears throat> we're, we're just going to cover people based on their bodies, which is kind of an awesome concept uh, instead of <laughs> stupid binary genders. So um, this, you know, language like this can help alleviate or override that bad language in an insurance policy. So creating change in your organization, there, there's a lot of different kinds of organizations. There's huge corporations, small companies, there's union shops, and there are state-specific laws. So we've got a handful of states, which is kind of cool now. Uh, you legally can't write an insurance plan that has trans inclusions. Now, one of the interesting things are is they're still doing it. And so you can help. There's, there's a variety of factors that come into play. Uh, on how you go about assessing your company or your employer's policy and say, is it trans-inclusive? Um, large companies are sometimes easier, easier, assuming you can get the right person, because they're self-insured. And what that means <clears throat> is that the, the employer contracts with an insurance company and says, OK, we want you to administer this plan. And, and so the claims come in, and they come out, and then the insurer just bills the employer and they just pay it and then pay a fee for doing that. And so the employer is really in the driver's seat, especially in large co corporations. They, they can literally write anything they want into the plan. And they say, this is what we want covered. And so if you can get to the right person, sometimes changing it in large companies can be a lot easier than smaller ones. Smaller shops typically have to pull a plan off a pick list or a menu. And then, uh, and then the other challenge you sometimes run into is when you say, hey, wait, I want a trans-inclusive plan. You may have an insurance rep that is not particularly interested in modifying. He just wants a standard template because he wants an easy job and easy commission and check out. And, and they may give a really adverse price for that insurance. And that needs to be pushed back on and say, you know, where, what is the claim and actuarial data you're basing this higher fee on? I'll get to cost in just a second. But, but some of this... Creating the change requires a lot of different, uh, some flexible strategies. And I'd say you need to talk to the decision maker. And I see so many trans people trying to make change in their organizations, and they talk to HR. And oftentimes, HR has nothing to do with this. It's people in benefits and typically a senior exec that signs off on these insurance contracts. So talking to the decision maker and pitching them is really critical. Um, talking to HR is just going to get some emails sent. Nothing will really happen. Uh, timing is key. You're in the right place at the right time, which is really cool. Um, in, a, in a couple months here, the insurers will be start gearing up about the 2017 plans. People will start talking about them. There'll be meetings and cost data, and contracts will start getting negotiated around the fall. So, so this is a good time to actually look at your employer's plan and say, how, do, how does my employers treat trans people? So... Um, one of the objections you hear is, oh, it's going to cost a whole lot of money. There's a really good study. San Francisco put in trans, fully trans-inclusive health care in 2001. The insurers went ballistic and said, oh, this is going to cost all this extra money. And they, they, they had a, around 70,000 people in the plan and another 30,000 dependents, I believe, in the city of San Francisco. And, and, and the insurers said, you know, we're going to have to add $1.71 surcharge per month per covered entity covered person uh, to pay for all this extra health care. And 
you know, these trans people are going to be flocking to San Francisco. We're going to have adverse selection. It's going to kill us in cost. <clears throat> and the city of San Francisco said, we want to do it. And they did it. And after five years, they, they wanted to go back and say, let's look at how this was, you know, what were the costs and what were the expenses in this? And they went back and realized that the insurers had collected $5.8 million in these surcharges and paid out $380,000 in claims. And they said, hey, wait a minute, you know, and they said, you know, we, because really there's not that many of us, and again, not every one of us have, we, we're each individuals, and what procedures we may or may not need or want or is related to our dysphoria, our specific dysphoria. So, so this, this, is, this was kind of a, a shock, and the insurer said, you know, I, I guess we don't need to charge a surcharge. We can just cover it like, uh, you know, uh, getting a burst appendix fixed. And they actually dropped the surcharge in, in 2006. Williams Institute get a, did a great study uh, of corporations that have trans-inclusive health care a couple years ago. And it, in, in a big survey, and they found 86% of companies found no increase in, um, in cost, which, which is really pretty, a pretty big deal. And so these are some really good references when somebody says, oh, it's going to cost a lot of money. Or that insurance rep comes back and say, yeah, it's going to double your insurance bill. These, there's some actual, you can say, where, show me that actual data. Where are you getting these numbers from? Because in many cases, they're completely imaginary. So the, um, the, the other things is, oh, frankly, some people just don't like us. There's a segment of society that really hates trans people. And they believe that being trans is a lifestyle choice or, or that this is cosmetic. And, and it's not. And if you look at every, every medical, the, the American Psychological Association, the American <coughs> Medical Association, American Academy of Family Physicians, one thing a lot of people don't realize is the IRS looked at this six years ago and they said, wow, this is medically necessary, and it's actually tax deductible. Transition-related health care is tax deductible, and the IRS doesn't really want to let anything be deductible. So if they say it's medically necessary, it's medically necessary. And of course, the world profession, the, the WPATH, which has been working with trans people and, and understanding us and, and how to alleviate this uh, dysphoria we feel for decades, a lot of experience. So when somebody says it's a lifestyle choice and, or we're disordered, they're, they're choosing to ignore science, which we unfortunately see a lot. Um, <clears throat> some closing points. I think uh, trans people face just horrible discrimination and exclusions in, in workplaces with, with health care is one example. And, and it get, provides us unequal treatment. And so so supplying needed medically necessary trans health care uh, improves productivity, reduces stress, and it can actually make, make an aspect for a company to recruit and retain people with diverse backgrounds. I won't work at a company that doesn't have fully trans inclusive insurance. And uh, this, is, this is going through the, the insurance plan is kind of an exercise. And I do, one of the things I've done is reverse engineering, and I think maybe that's uh, turned out to be a good skill to figure out how insurance plans work. But, uh, you know, as you start going through your employee, your SPD and the back end clinical guidelines, sometimes asking for help to interpret how does this affect trans, real life trans people is, is really important. And, and then finally, recruiting allies and senior management and, and make sure you're working with the, the right contract contact. There's a lot of individuals, I'll say, um, I got interested in this, I guess about uh, seven years ago, I was at a trans health conference with uh, Andre Wilson. Uh, him and Jameson have been working this area for more than a decade, and it, I, we really got to thinking, you know, I was, had some coffee, and it's like, we really could change and get trans-inclusive insurance in companies. And uh, there's a lot of local Minnesota efforts. Uh, I put some resources on the QR code, and it's at the next link, too, and I'll make sure uh, you, you've got access to it. But um, this is certainly not cosmetic. Um, it's, it's really critical. And I think I'll, I'll close uh, with the bathroom bills. And it's so awesome to be at a place that is not policing bathrooms. I, I just, you know, right now we have 45 pieces of legislation this year in 19 states to ban trans people's access to the bathroom. And it's, it's really quite scary if you're trans. 
because there's, and, and some of these laws, including the Minnesota law, makes it illegal for an employer to yet let an employee use a restroom corresponding to their gender identity. So that's a really dangerous law when, when these le they're trying to legislate businesses and say, oh wait, you can't be trans inclusive. So, uh, and I just remind you that there's been more Republican US senators arrested for bathroom misconduct than trans people. And if you think about that, there's only 100 sitting US senators at a time. And there's 700,000 of us. It's like, maybe we should be looking at uh, putting some regulations on senators. So I think um, I'll close it with that. And it's, I don't know if I have time or any questions or just close. So I'll close and thank you very much. It's so exciting to be here. And I'll